Sister Loretta Palomara was not famous. She was not a celebrity. She achieved nothing extraordinary, heroic, or earth-shattering. Nothing that will go down in history or change lives. Unless, that is, she happened to touch your life. Two decades ago, Cabrini, New York's first hospice, and Sister Loretta Palomara, its first spiritual minister, quietly made history. Her life here was an expression of unconditional forgiveness and sacred love, and she showed us how to find these miraculous gifts within ourselves. She was a, a school teacher, and uh, some priest took over her parish and didn't like her, and she, was, she lost her position and broke her heart. But that was a blessing because uh, she found the greatest likeness to Jesus and the greatest gift she gave the world being here. Uh, even though this is a new floor, it's beautiful. The only thing I feel that might be missing is Sister Loretta, the true angel of mercy. She was a gem. Very, very few people were like her. I believe God created her for this kind of work, and she did it. To the hilt. I remember Sister Loretta as always being a very loving presence with her patients and she would always be entering the world of that patient to be there as a comforting presence and if a patient was frightened or anxious or confused or disoriented she would just be inside that patient's world and comforting that patient from within it. If the patient was calling for their mother, she would be that person's mother. My mother-in-law was in the hospital during the Jewish holiday of Purim, and you give out a basket with candies and all kinds of goodies in it, and I had forgotten about the hospital, and when we about that holiday, and when we came that day to visit my mother-in-law, there was a basket that said Purim blessings from Sister Loretta, and I guess I was surprised <laughs> that she would know about this holiday and that I realized she must acknowledge everybody's holidays and everything of equal importance and she took the time and it came with a little card with some of her drawings on it and um, it meant a lot to all of us, it meant a lot to my mother-in-law. She gave my mother the confident warmth she needed. She couldn't get that from us, her family, as much as she did get it from Sister Loretta. At one time she even came with her sister, Sister Regina. And that was quite a treat. It was just on a Sunday, and we insisted they stay with us, which they did for a few hours. And it was a big, big help to my mother. You know, I, I still feel her presence very strong, especially when funny things happen. I could sense her laughing and saying, ha, 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 or try to get out of this one. If you notice, the two angels have uh, two different poses. One is like this, and one is like this. So we used to identify. And Patty, Sister Loretta, I'll be calling her Patty because she wasn't born Sister Loretta. She used to say she was like this because the angel was going, I wonder what she's up to next. And the other angel was supposed to be me saying, what could I possibly be involved in? So it was like those two expressions went together. Right after my mother-in-law died, she wrote us a letter. Can I share that with you? Oh, I'd love to see it. Sure. Uh, she didn't put a date on it, but I know that it was right after my mother-in-law had passed away. I guess we had finished, finished sitting Shiva. And um, can I read it to you? Robert Roberta, you are my loves. I'm pained at your pain. Do know that I ask the good Lord to take you both under his shelter and love you with abundance, Sister Loretta. 
and this is 17 years ago and I've saved it and it um, when you called and I went to look for it I took it and I just hugged it because it brought back such strong feelings of her she was really such a way about her spirit I won't tell you the grandmother grand uh, children's story that's one of the best but uh, I think I don't know if everybody knows this sister Loretta used to say to me when people see me little children she was great with children not only to uh, cuddle them and play with them, but to bring them in to help the, their loved ones and their families uh, go through what they were going through. And she said, when little children see me, they get frightened because I'm so big. So I always say, don't be afraid, I'm soft and fluffy. That's a real Sister Loretta remark. I was on the way uh, passing door and I see two little girls crying. One's flat one's ten. And they were crying. Well, I stepped in the room, and the grandmother was the patient. The grandmother was in a summer coma. And um, the mother and father were at the foot of the bed, and there was two kids crying I've never seen. So I just said, can I have the kids? <laughs> and I was surprised that the kids came with me. Uh, but they right away they came right with me. I said, can I have the kids for a little bit? And they came right with me, and I said, gee, what am I gonna do with them now? <laughs> So I took them to my office and I was going to give them something, a little medal or something. And I said, no, I don't want to get that one. <laughs> so I said to the older girl, did you make the first communion? And she goes, no, what? <laughs> so I said, Not, nothing holy here. <laughs> and when the kids uh, would come here with the families, sometimes they would be running up and down the corridor. And she had a way of inviting them in the office and she'd get out the scissors and she'd have them cutting and she'd keep them busy, she'd keep them occupied. She could do anything. One of the children noticed I had a little thing set up like a little prayer table. You know, I had a combination of items there. And the little girl, the older girl said, can I see a prayer for my grandmother? And I said, fine, that would be fine. So she sat down and uh, she went like this. Dear God, please make Grandma well so she can come home again. Amen. Now I knew Grandmother would die that night or the night after, next. I knew that. So I'm hearing her prayer, which is a good thing. And I'm feeling, oh, it's not going to like God <laughs> after today or tomorrow. It's going to be mad at him because she prayed, you know? So um, I said, well, can I say a prayer, Joe? She said, yeah. And I said, dear God, I said, Grandma's such a wonderful person. She is so good to everybody. And you know uh, that, you know, I know, God, that you give us uh, such a beautiful life. You give us a path that leads to you. And uh, now Grandma's on that part of the path, which soon she's going to be with Grandpa. And she's going to be coming home to you. And she's going to be with Grandpa pretty soon. And would you please make them happy together? And so forth like that. That was my main affair. Well, when I finished, the little girl looked up at me and she said, you know, I like your prayer better. <laughs> you know, the things that she taught me, uh, so practical, trying to be non-threatening, trying not to uh, be religious, but just trying to meet the person where they're at. So then I said, well, any kids want to give something to Grandma to take with her for her journey? Well, they both lifted up the postcard, and I said, no, she can't take that. You know what she could take? She could take a song in her heart. So we, we tried, three of us, trying to get a song that the three of us knew. Well, we landed up with Mary Had a Little Lamb. <laughs> <laughs> While we're practicing, I'm thinking, how can I go in that room? <laughs> saying Mary Had a Little Lamb with these kids. I remember uh, when I first started working, one day she said to me, she said, what do you do, John, when you go into a room? What do you say to the people? And I didn't know too much about hospice work then. And I remember saying, <laughs> oh, 
I'd like to, is there any way I can be a ministry to you? And Sister Loretta said, what? She said, they don't even know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> well, I took the kids by the hand. I said, come on, let's go, it's time. So I went in, I didn't even look at the mother and father. <laughs> I was too scared. <laughs> I was too scared. So I, I went in, took the kids by the hand, and went right to the side wheels there. I said, Grandma, we got a surprise for you. We got something for you to take to Grandpa. Something for your journey, and you put it right in your heart, you know, and I'm talking like that, and then, like I said, I'm not looking up at the <laughs> And I was having two kids here, the puppet, and we got Mary had a little lamb, a little lamb, a little lamb, sing all five verses. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Before she was struck by lightning, um, we were the same size, so it was an occasion of really fooling people. And I'll tell you, we milked it for all it was worth. And then she was struck by lightning. And we didn't see each other often. We weren't allowed to in those days. But I was able to see her, I think, maybe six months later. And, and she, I didn't recognize her. I thought she was another sister coming out of all. And she knew I didn't recognize her. And she said, um, it's me, you know, because I heard her voice. And that was the beginning of a lot of suffering. I think. I still have memories coming, walking, getting off the elevator and walking in here. And the first thing I would want to do is go in to see Sister Loretta. And she'd be at her desk. And she'd have uh, all the baskets in the back. And her little, uh, the thing she used to push around with the band-aid boxes on it. With the crayons and all that in there. And this was the old hospice, but it certainly served its purpose and did a great job. Right down the hall there, that was... If I'm not mistaken, wasn't that Sister Loretta's room? You're absolutely right. Yeah. That's it. That's the room down the end, on the right, that my father was in. And, although it's empty and barren now, a great deal of love and warmth and comfort was given to many, many patients here. Yeah? That's the very room my dad passed away in, 18 years ago. You remember the table she used to have out there? With, uh, oh, yeah. Every day she would have something different. She was so creative, like uh, uh, Kwanzaa, she'd have a little setup for Kwanzaa, St. Patrick's Day, Valentine's Day, uh, you name it, she'd have something oh, yeah. out there. Oh, yeah, World yeah. Series. Yeah, World uh, Series, Super Bowl, right, she'd have right. something out there for that. Well, this is, this is known as Sister Loretta's table, and the reason for that is I, I when I was designing the old unit on the sixth floor, there was a uh, section of wall across from the nurse's station, and Sister Loretta came over to me one day and in a very, very serious tone of voice asked me, what did you intend to do with this wall, EJ? And I looked at her and I said, well, actually, I wasn't going to do anything the wall, with the wall because I knew it was the wall she kept a cart in front of, but was there anything she would like me 
to do for that. And she asked me if she could put her cart there and leave that section of water alone. Uh, and I asked her if she'd like a new cart. And I also told her that the cart could have a storage behind it. And she asked me if it could be on wheels so, so she could move it. And I said, certainly they could build it that way. And uh, she came over, the huge smile on her face, and she hugged me. And if you've ever been hugged by Sister Loretta, this is something you don't easily forget. She was a very special person, and she had a way of bringing comfort to people. And she had a way of really making people feel comfortable, at ease. She's the type of person that could uh, just walk in a room and hold somebody by the hand and start stroking the hand, making them feel comfortable and at ease. And automatically they just start talking about what's on their mind and just had a way with people. God bless Sister Loretta also, who did so much spiritually for everyone. God bless Sister Loretta. Yeah. Oh, her spirit is still here. I feel it permeating this place. Vera. They were running down the you hall. Spread a into the room, it, one wall would be filled with baskets with all kinds of metals, rubber bands, clips. You know, we, lo we looked forward to seeing her. We used to come in the office and she always had, you know, words of encouragement and support to give us. It's very different now. <laughs> okay, then we come over here. There were desks, TV, all kinds of stuff on the floor. Magazines. M magazines, newspapers. And here was where the um, music therapist had her little cubby hole. And then there were doors, and behind that was the Holy of Holy Sister Loretta. Mary, I, you know, I just thought of something. This is so much irony. If Patty saw a film, she'd always critique it for me. And if there were, a, there were many times there, there was a, a film of somebody in utter poverty. And there would be a bedroom for the person in the film that would consist of a chair and a table and nothing else. Just like this. And she'd say, you know, my favorite part of that film was that bedroom. I wish it were mine. I wish I could live a simple life. This was a goal to her, and uh, just not to be cluttered. You know, this was a, in, in a sense, this was an ideal for her. And it's funny, we come into this sacred space over here, and this is, I, I just feel her laughing, going, ha, 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 I got my way. I get a call at the beginning. Sister? Just come over right away. Jack, Jack uh, insisted on, on that. Got to call his family, and you know he's okay. He's laughing and joking, and 
he's really he's really not bad now. He's he's all right, but he he kept insisting, and he's he's getting very very agitated, and and I didn't know what to do, so so I called them. So when we get here, I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> <laughs> you come over. So uh, I didn't know what to do with them either, but I, just, I wanted to support her, so. So I came over, I went right to Jack's room, and Jack is there, oh, hi, sister. Um, come on, sit down, you know, so I'm sitting right next to him. And he's talking all, you know, chit-chat, chit-chat. It's nothing uh, extraordinary. You know, and I'm, I'm getting very, very uncomfortable because, like, his sister and his wife, his daughter, and all of them come in. And we're, we're just chit chatting. <laughs> so his wife comes in, stands at the foot of the bed, and uh, I, I don't even want to look at her. I'm so talking to Jack <laughs> and about this nurse and isn't she cute and this, you know. And then his sister, his two sisters come in. You know, they come in. Uh, I peek, panic look. And they stand at the foot of the bed. Then his daughter comes in. His daughter's about 25. She comes in and she stands at the foot of the bed. And there they are, four women, four o'clock in the morning, wondering why were they called. Jack and I are just having a you know light conversation. Well, I'm feeling so uncomfortable, I can't even look at them. But I did notice, one by one, they left the room. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill Jack. You know? <laughs> but Jack reaches over to me, and he, he pulls my arm, and, and he's shaking it, shaking it like that. He said, Sister, you see that silence? You see that silence? I said, uh, Jack, it's 4 o'clock in the morning. They were called. They think you're at your worst. And here you and I are chit-chatting, you know? And uh, so I think that they're very annoyed. He goes, you don't understand. You see that silence? They haven't talked to each other in 17 years. One of the things she was really, I think the thing she was the most proud about is being a missionary sister. Being a missionary sister, that made her, that made her, top of the world, and she uh, she was very humbled by it. And then he said, "Sister, it's time for me to go. I can't go yet until this is taken care of. Would you please help me?" So I reached way, way down, picked up my heart off the floor, and I said, okay. Before we entered, she entered first, two years before me, um, she had a note in her purse, and the note said, if I do not become a missionary sister, I will die of a broken heart. I never knew she had that note in her purse, but uh, she she told me this before she passed on. So I passed the nurses station and I looked. I looked at Rita and I said to Rita, "Pray like hell." <laughs> okay. So. I went in and I got four women. I, I, I met them, I took them in a private room. I could hardly breathe, you know, because they were very solemn. I, I was very, very solemn. I took them in a room and I said, these are Jack's words. Could each of you, when Jack had told me to say, you know, like this, could each of you reach way down in your heart and find something to forgive each other for what happened 17 years ago? 
right at that moment, I thought that's when it all slapped me. And I had just said, you know, reach down in your heart. Could you find something to forgive each other, whatever happened 72 years ago? Well, they all burst out crying, including me. I really burst out crying. They were crying. They started hugging each other and embracing each other and touching each other and saying how stupid they were to let the whole the whole time pass along and they're having such misery because they couldn't they couldn't forgive each other. So for Jack they did. Matter of fact they walked down the hallway, four of them, hand in hand. They got to Jack's door, they couldn't fit in the door. <laughs> they went, they got to the foot of the bed, and I went in, I was shaking so much. I was, I could hardly, I was shaking so much. I went, I went right to Jack, I said, Jack, here's your family. And I left the room. The last year, I had seen her go down quite a bit. And I was following, I, I had a, like a pattern. Every time I saw her, I would say to myself, is this the last time? Is this the last time? And I think she felt that too. I know she felt that. And uh, you take these moments to be really gracious and gentle with each other. That's past up here. <laughs> uh, Jack died in his sleep about two or three nights later. But, um, they had resolved, and they had resolved. And uh, when they went to the, this was a Jewish family. When they went to the, uh, went to the service the next day, and uh, they were all talking to each other. And matter of fact, Jack's mother was alive, and she probably wondered what happened. <laughs> you know, but they were talking together, and uh, they did that for the brother, no, the Jack. Agatha called me at home on Sunday night about 9.30, quarter to 10. She said, Amelia, I said, yes, Agatha, how are you? She said, where are you? I said, I'm in my bed. She said, what are you doing? I said, just finish saying my prayer. She said, I have a bad news for you. I said, what is the bad news? She said, she's not well. We just had to take her downstairs. Stella had been working right in this space. Yeah. She 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 had called me about seven o'clock at night. She goes, your, your sister can't keep her food down. She, you better uh, come over. I'm going to take her down to the emergency. She's not feeling good this afternoon. I said, Stella, I'll be right there. That was the Sunday. I got up in the morning, morning. I said a prayer for her. And I came into work. At 10 o'clock, I was here. I went straight up to ICU. And when I saw her, I said, this is not a person that I know. When I was in the car, the twin cab, of course, the car coming over the 59th Street Bridge, I was very quiet. I, I just knew it. It was the time. And uh, the cab driver said to me, do you mind putting on, if I put on music? I said, no, fine. And I'm sitting there, and the first words from that radio was Simon and Garfunkel singing, Sail on, Silver Girl, Sail on High. And that's what we used to say to each other. Sail on, Silver Girl, Sail on High. And I, I just, actually what I did was I turned around like, it was such a shock to get that message. And I took it as this is the moment. I took that as really God's trying to send me a sign. And when I went into the emergency room, Patty was, she was lucid. And she knew I loved the Knicks. She says, Rosemary, the Knicks are on now. And actually at that time they went into overtime. So I said, uh, yeah, I know, and because uh, I had just come home. And uh, she was breathing, she was very laboring. 
breathing. And at that point, everything she said about assisting the dying came to me, about holding her hand, about, about the gently rubbing their arm, about talking, and talking about something that might be bothering them, an unfinished job, uh, something that they didn't get to yet. So I took her hand and I knew, I knew for years what bothered her the most was the accumulation of every paper she ever had in her life, of papers, letters, pictures, and that accumulation in her uh, office and apartment really disturbed her very much. She couldn't handle it, she'd box it. So uh, I knew that disturbed her and I said, Patty, don't worry, I'll take care of your stuff. And with that, she smiled. I said, gentle Jesus, gentle Jesus, be with us. And then she, her eyes stopped. She was so good to me when my husband died. She was ill. And it had touched me. And I will say this, I am Mr. Great Lord. She's not here anymore. She's the one that is missed here and I have missed her. But I know that I met one of the greatest human beings that ever lived in Sister Loretta, and I owe so much to her. Jesus, she was, she, he lived on in her as in very few people, and were all the beneficiaries. <coughs> Cabrini Hospice really is her creation. You know, we put these little relics away. We know she passed through this earth. We know she touched us all. We have, we'll always have them to remind us. And what are they? They are life. Choosing life, celebrating life. Relationships. Well, I think you're still calling us. You're calling us to be gentle. Thank you, Patty. About four years ago, we opened what we call Sister Loretta Sunshine Kids in honor, memory of uh, our former pastoral care coordinator who had been a first grade uh, school teacher for 25 years and then hospice uh, uh, pastoral care for 17 years. And so I could say to sum everything up is that uh, spiritually and uh, her spirit will live in hospice always because she's a part of hospice she may be gone in body but she'll live on because her word speaks for her being a missionary sister of the sacred heart of jesus she lived what she professed and uh, for me to remember her is to live in the light rather than in darkness. For me to remember her is to continue his mission, his message, his message of love. 
message of light to all. To all of you, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May he shine his face upon you. And may he give you peace. And may you know the joy of his love. Amen. Amen. Oh